by SOCOM athletes. Send me. Thanks for tuning in to SOCOM Athletes Podcast, Simi. This is your host, Jason, and today I'm on with a very special guest, and this is Chief Ramon Colon Lopez. He is the SEAC, the highest ranking enlisted member, and he is a pararescue man, and I remember seeing him for the first time when I was at the PJ Doc course, and he walked in there. This was 2009, and his ribbon rack was so large, I couldn't even count everything, and he had this big smile on his face and gave us this speech super inspirational person and it's just an honor to have him on with us tonight so cz thank you so much for coming on how are you my brother oh, i'm doing great jason and again you know it's amazing how uh how quick time flies but uh good to see you here brother thank you and thank you for your time i know that you're a busy man so it's great to have you on and we'll be on live q a with some of our students later uh some of our team leaders as well but first, we just want to hear a little bit about CZ's story. And so before we get into that, he is the SEAC. And I want him to tell us a little bit about what that is. I know I had to do some research on what that is, SEAC number four, and it is quite an incredible position. So please tell us a little bit about that, CZ. No, absolutely. So uh, again, I grew up in uh, in the special operations career field as a pararescue man. And uh, at some point, my joint experience ended up paying out into uh, being selected as the four SEAC, uh, the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, when I took over the position in December, you know, this is something that few people know, but uh, I quit being a chief. When they created the insignia, the rank, uh, the actual rank is SEAC. So it's still kind of funky and weird. Not, it, I still answer to chief, but uh, the rank now is uh, SEAC. So um, the position itself is a conduit of information at the highest levels of the Department of Defense. And it is by definition and by duties, the highest enlisted position in the Department of Defense. And the difference between me and the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force for the audience, which is primarily interested in uh, special tactics um, or special warfare for that matter, is that you know the service senior enlisted advisors deal with their Title 10 authorities, and that is manning, training, and equipping the the combatant commands, which are on an even playing field, are the executioners of mission and warfare. Me, I'm a level above being the conduit of information to the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, and at times the President when it comes to issues that affect the total enlisted force. A lot of that has to do with creating policies. A lot of that, a lot of that has to do advocating at highest levels when it comes to benefits, compensation, and things of that nature. And as an example, something that is going to be critical for every body that is probably interested in this podcast is our way ahead on the, the maintenance of the human weapon system, especially when it comes to brain injury and other issues. How do we get a preventive system in place instead of a reactive system? So that is something that I'm going to be tackling hard and heavy here in the next calendar year. But uh, I have an open door to the chairman by being selected by him and uh, also to the secretary of defense. And uh, we have a voice now at the highest levels on things that make sense and things that will not well, uh, be well received by the force. But that is just a quick uh, synopsis and soundbite on what the SEAC does. Incredible. And for our listeners out there, when I say CZ in the special operations communities, pararescue in particular, you have what's called your operator initials, and it would be your first letter or first and last letter of your last name. And that's how you mark your gear and, uh, and also how you come on on the radio. So if you don't mark your gear for those of you, you pups out there. Okay. If you don't mark your gear, when you first get to your station, you're going to get a whole load of gear. You could fill your whole garage up with, you don't mark it and it's laying around the squad and somebody's probably going to snag it. So you, you see everyone's gear. It's got the two letters on it. So that's CZ. Uh, that's who we're referring to. And, and, and CZ, when you talk about the, the uh, chief of staff, the joint chief of staff, who exactly is this? So the construct right now you have, so you have the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, and that is uh, appointed. And then the joint chiefs are the service chiefs. I like the chief of staff of the Air Force, the commandant of the Marine Corps, the chief of naval operations, and so on. So that comprises the joint chiefs. In my duty as the SEAC, I act on behalf of the chairman and interact with the senior enlisted advisors for the joint chiefs. So that is, uh, that is our construct at the Pentagon. And these chiefs, are they four-star generals, CZ? 
They are, every single one of them, including the newest one, which is the Space Force. And you have the National Guard Bureau and the Coast Guard represented in that forum. Wow. So, so this position, it is available. You can compete for this position from all branches and you are representing the air force in this position. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that is correct. So I'm the first airman to be selected for the position. Wow. And of course, the first PJ, is that correct? CZ? Uh, yeah. I mean, they typically uh, don't like our kind making policy. <laughs> so it's knuckle draggers, but mediators, uh, right? <laughs> It just it just worked out this way. It worked out well because uh, we uh, we really speak truth to power. You know, we're very concise and brief and to the point, and we just call it what it is. And I believe that that's what General Milley appreciates the most about having me, a special operator, as his senior enlisted advisor. Amen, CZ. It's incredible to see you in that position at the highest of the high, living by the motto, these things we do that others may live. And I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the side of growing up and being born in Puerto Rico. And you, a lot of our listeners out there maybe aren't aware that if you are born in Puerto Rico, you're a United States citizen and you have the opportunity to serve the United States military. CZ, can you tell us a little bit more about that and your beginnings into this whole journey? Well, so born and raised in Puerto Rico, like you said, I was born in 1971 and grew up in a coastal town southwest of the island called uh, Guanica. I was born in Ponce, but was uh, raised in Guanica and always in the ocean. I think that that was one of my biggest uh, prep grounds when I finally came into the pipeline. But, uh, you know, just love being outdoors. I mean, my mother couldn't keep me indoors for anything, either riding a bike, you know, just hiking, swimming, surfing, you name it, doing all kinds of different things as a kid. And uh, we grew up poor. So at one point, the jobs dried up in Puerto Rico. So both of my parents had to seek employment elsewhere. So we sold everything we own. And uh, with the clothes on our backs, ended up uh, landing in New York and then uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And I went to high school not speaking English. Uh, I had to learn. I was an uh, English as a second language student. And then entered college after graduation from high school. And I was in Sacred Heart University with uh, hopes of becoming a doctor someday. So I, my uh, major was biology at the time. But college didn't last long just because I didn't have the, the self-discipline uh, I was basically just raging, raging, uh, just partying. Uh, I, I, just, I was just not a disciplined person. So one day I just drove by the recruiter and, uh, and say, hey, uh, get me the hell out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. What can I do? And uh, they just brought me to the Air Force uh, Open General. Uh, but that was uh, pretty much my upbringing in Puerto Rico and how I landed in the United States Air Force. Wow. And CZ, my father was a PJ. Um, he served in the late 80s and early 90s down at the 1730th Pararescue Squad at Eglin. That's actually where I was born. And, and, you know, separate story for a separate time. We ended up serving together at the 306 Rescue Squadron. He reenlisted. But he told me and a lot of the, the guests that we've had on that were PJs, kind of old school PJs, told me that when they went through, they didn't even know about pararescue as is, is being an option. Like they went to boot camp, basic training, and then were, were shown a video. W was that the case with you or, or was it a little different? Man, let me tell you something. So <laughs> when I came into basic training, I barely spoke English still. I mean, my English was pretty broken. So I, don't, I understood half the stuff that was said to me. The other stuff, I just smiled at it, which got me into a lot of trouble. But I remember the day that the OLH at the time was coming in to brief. And I asked my, uh, my drill instructor, I was just like, hey, that, that sounds pretty interesting. What's that? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it, Colon Lopez. You won't make it through that. Just keep on carrying on with your days. I was just like, okay. So missed opportunity. You know, I remember a couple of the guys uh, from my uh, flight, you know, 3711th uh, BMTS, going through the uh, tryouts and coming back with it, they're telling between their legs. And I was like, man, that was hard. So um, I didn't think twice about it. Then at one point, uh, I'm deciding whether I'm going to stay in the Air Force or not. And by chance, this PJ comes by the section that I was, I was a traffic manager. I was the person that shipped your house of goods when you PCS. And uh, this PJ, Gary Lurie, came by our section and he asked me, he's like, hey, you're a pretty good chef. Have you ever thought about being a PJ? I was like, man, I don't know what the hell that is. And he's like, have lunch with me tomorrow. I'll tell you all about it. 
So he told me about everything. And uh, I was just like, oh, that sounds pretty good. I think that that's more better suited for me uh, based on the energy level that I had at the time. And, you know, my, uh, my quest and search for a purpose in life. What Gary didn't tell me was about the pain of the two-year pipeline. So I went in into pararescue totally blind. Not only did I, I, did I not know what pararescue was, I had no clue what the pipeline was gonna be all about. And this is free YouTube videos and everything else. I mean, we just had word of mouth back in those days. But man, I got in and uh, once I got in the, in the program, you know, uh, it was do or die, really. So this, so this gentleman took you, what was his name again? CZ? Uh, he retired as senior master sergeant Gary Lurie, Mr. Lurie. So, so, Gary, so Gary Lurie takes you to lunch. And for our listeners out there, never stop at the opportunity to mentor somebody and, and, and be able to spread your knowledge and help somebody and bring them into their community. Because if it wasn't for Gary taking some time with CZ, I mean, things could have been different. Maybe he would have got on this path, uh, but who knows? So never stop at the opportunity to take somebody and, and make them better and make the world a better place. So pretty incredible opportunity there. So you find out about it and uh, you don't necessarily know if you're prepared or not, but you did grow up in the water. CZ, so you have a little bit of advantage, right? You're a PT stud. So, so how was PJ in doc for you? Was it called the OLJ back then or, or what, what was the deal? So it was called uh, operating location hotel or the OLH. OLH. Jason, I was 142, 145 pounds wet when I went to the pipeline. You know, I, I've always been a, a little guy and uh, I reported, man. And of course you have the Johnny football heroes, the NCAA uh, two-time athletes, you know, <laughs> coming, uh, coming through the pipeline. So man, it was pretty intimidating at first. And I remember I was just like, all right, so if this is going to be kind of like one of those from uh, sun up to sundown type, type things, let me try to go ahead and out, outsmart the system. And uh, man, I made the mistake of uh, reporting for the 3D orientation for cross trainees with uh, chloroform boots. I'm like, if I don't have to shine these things, I can get a leg up on the, um, uh, doing things. And that's when I first met uh, Staff Sergeant Terry Ness. Terry Ness looked at my boots and he said, what the fuck strat is that? I was just like, it's a uh, uh, boot. So like, Are you a jumper? I was just like, no. He's like, then why in the fox strat are you wearing freaking jump boots? He's like, take them off. I was just like, uh, Sergeant, take them off. So took them off. By the way, they had a zipper on the side too for EC on, EC off. So he took these things and uh, he went ahead, disappeared with the boots, come back with a uh, can of lighter fluid and set them on fire right there. Then he tells me, you got 30 minutes to go to clothing sales down the road and get some real boots and come back. All right. And they better be shy. So that was day one for me when I first record, uh, reported to the OLH. But, uh, you know, took me a pretty good lesson that, uh, you know, this place is not a place where you take shortcuts. Did you make your time hacks easy? Did, did you get it there and back? Oh, no, man. No? <laughs> I was like, how, how could you possibly get that done? Especially with how long you could be in line down there sometimes to get your boots. Yeah, but I mean, he knew that. He knew that it was, that it was unrealistic for me to go ahead and make it work. But he wanted to see how much effort I put into that. And he told me that later on. And he's like, hey, you know that everything, once you set foot here in this sacred ground, everything is a test. And you're always going to be tested. And the key deciding factor is whether you stay or go. So that was something that, uh, that stayed with me even to this day. And how was that course for you? I mean, I mean, you're looking at underwater swimming, crossovers at the time, lots of running, rucking, uh, calisthenics, getting hazed, really getting beat down, sleep deprivation, a lot of mind games. How was that for you? So again, you know, my body size didn't really play to an advantage and also my height, you know, I'm, I'm five, eight. And, uh, some of the, I was comfortable in the water. I mean, I had no problem doing on the waters and everything else, but something that always messed with my mind was bobbing because I will see these other taller guys, you know, five, 10, six feet tall. I mean, they were breaking the surface and me, it was pretty much go, go gadget lips. And every once in a while, we'll take a swig of water down. So that was something that I really struggled with, but I always made it through. Um, I had to deal with an ankle injury at one time, which made the weight belt swim 
really, really challenging. And that was uh, the first time I, I got set back. And I got set back on week eight of training. And uh, I, had, I was sent back to Randolph where I was stationed to go ahead and rejoin the next class after the holiday break. So that was, that was a, a mind game to where I really needed to go ahead and uh, regroup and see, uh, see how much I wanted, I wanted it. But I will tell you this, uh, Jason. So right before I left for, uh, for the OLH INDAC, as, as we know it, the person that was supervising me at the time was a civilian. He told me, I'm not worried about losing you. You'll come back with your tail in between your legs because it's hard to make it through that course and you're not that type of person. Uh, so that was always in the back of my mind and uh, that was my motivation. Motivation number two was that the article had just been published about Gothic Serpent, you know, Mogadishu, Somalia, and the actions of the PJs during the Black Hawk Down mission. So I always kept that book. And then there was another article about Sky Garrett. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and Scott Scotty Garrett surviving, you know, the free fall accident. Free fall accident. He actually, uh, you know, plummeted to the ground. So I had a couple of pieces of motivation that kept me, uh, that kept me trucking. That's incredible, CZ. And, and, you know, it's, you talked about your, your drill instructor and now, and now this man telling you, you're not going to be able to do it. And that seemed to be your, your fuel, your motivation getting through. And it, we talk, we teach our students about underwater swimming, counting your strokes. And you look at the pure mathematics of somebody that's taller than somebody that's shorter. And it's going to be a little bit more challenging to get from one side of the pool to the other. You're going to be under the water a little bit longer. It's just mathematics. So you see these guys, they're a little bit tougher, man. They had to get through. It's a little bit more challenging. So that's awesome that you were able to overcome that. And after you got done with this course, did you go on to Army Combat Dive School? I did. So, and we were the fir- one of the first classes that ended up doing the water inf- infiltration course. They took LAR-5 uh, out of the, the program at that time. So we were one of the first class, uh, classes to, uh, to do that. I believe we were either the second or the third class in the pipe. Uh, when that decision uh, was made at Key West. But yeah, I ended up going through that and then all of the other courses, you know, airborne, underwater, egress, sear, free fall, and, and, and so on. And that's a, it's a long pipeline. You're looking at probably a year and a half, two years. And at the time, did you guys do the EMT intermediate course or how was the medical portion of that pipeline? No, so we were doing the EMT paramedic paramedic and, uh, yeah that was you know it's it's really condensed and compressed and uh the the days are long you still have your duties to pt you have clinical rotations all of the classroom stuff to pass the national registry testing and uh it, it was challenging you know i remember at the same time that i was studying for my paramedic exam i was studying for staff sergeant and i remember just bouncing back and forth from test to test and, uh, you know, just being so focused that I, I barely had a social life at the time. Wow. I'm sure you had to sacrifice a lot of sleep during those times, too, to make it all work. Yeah. You know, and uh, Starbucks was, uh, was not <laughs> a caffeine. So, yeah, a lot of caffeine, you know, and uh, just, you know, basically getting together with some of the other bubbles, not on the, on the staff sergeant side, but on the paramedic side to be able to go ahead and go round robins and do the practicals and everything else. In CZ, we, after you graduate, you get your beret. Okay. What was that like for you? I mean, actually finally getting there and earning this maroon beret and getting stationed to your teams. I mean, that had to have been incredible. All these people told you you couldn't do it. And here you are, you did it. <laughs> yeah. So the day that we graduated the old age, I think that that was one of the most significant days. And the reason for that is, because, remember, I mentioned that I was looking for a purpose in life. After making it through that and seeing everybody that didn't make it through, it told me that you have a specific talent that you better do something with it. And I had some great friends that we ended up forging relationships. You know, a lot of them came to my, uh, to my swearing in as the SEAC. I mean, that's how tight we are. But, uh, you know... When I finally graduated uh, PJ training, you know, and I, I was an average PJ, man. I was not an award winner or anything like that. I, w- I was good enough. And there were some studs in the class, you know, but uh, good enough in, in, this, uh, in this company, it's phenomenal. And uh, I was okay with that, but I realized the talents that I had. One of the first things that I did is uh, make sure that I reached out to those people that told me that I wasn't going to be able to make it and uh, given the news. 
Because that was, you know, and I told him, thank you for the motivation. Because, you know, without that in the back of that mind, that devil just poking me with that pitchfork every day, um, I, I probably would have not made it because it's, it's tough. And everybody that enters a training will tell you the same story. But uh, once I made it as a pararescue man, I knew that I had a purpose in life. And it was at that moment as an E4 that I knew that I was going to be in the Air Force for 30 years, that I wanted to be a chief a pararescue chief, and that was going to be my life. Incredible. And where did you get stationed first? So I went to Holloman Air Force Base, and that was when the 48th first moved from Florida out to, uh, to Alamogordo, New Mexico. And uh, this, was a, this was a weird time for assignments because, yeah, you had the 48th in Alamogordo. Um, the 38th was moving from Patrick to Moody and then Vegas. So those were the three options we had. And uh, I got assigned to Holloman. And I was just like, man, I mean, that's probably the suckiest one out of the three. But it was at Holloman that I met my wife now for uh, 24 years. Now, All right. Praise God, man. That's, good. that's a good excuse. Everything, everything happens for a reason. So, and again, you know, that was a, a great, great uh, training ground for preparing for the 24 special tactics because I only did two years, a little bit over two years in a conventional unit before I tried out as a, as a young uh, E4 to go to the 24th. Awesome. Thanks for leading us into that, CZ. And it definitely takes a special woman and a special type of family in order to, to do that. And shout out to our guy that was on that mission right over in Nigeria, tip of the spear. Uh, SEAL Team 6 not only operates as a SEAL team, but brings pararescue men, combat controllers, and other personnel on their team. Uh, the Air Force, especially AFSOC, and the 24th Special Tactics Squadron is the tip of the spear for these joint operations. And CZ was right on the front lines of that. Um, if you haven't done so already, please get on Google and check out some of CZ's story. Um, you can type in hunting down the terrorists. He's also at the Air Force Museum and he's done some great things. We've also had another guest on recently, uh, retired Chief Master Sergeant James Sanchez has spent some time up there at the 2-4 as well. So CZ, let's talk a little bit about that, man. I mean, uh, green team, as they call it, I know we have to be careful about everything that, that we talk about, but how, how did it work as far as being this conventional PJ and then, and then getting on green team and, and assessing to this next level of operator, the tier one operator? Well, like I mentioned earlier, because of, uh, you know, Scotty Fails and Tim Wilkinson in Somalia, that became a goal from the beginning. And by the way, when I was going through the pipeline and we graduated uh, jump school at Fort Benning, the 24th was doing a joint readiness exercise, a JRX at Benning. So I actually had uh, Tim Wilkinson basically giving my blood wings at the time. When that's oh, man, what an honor. So, yeah, so that was, uh, that was a goal always to end up at the 24 Special Tactics. So I went uh, from the 48th and uh, assessed to North Carolina. And I will tell you that as a young PJ with only two years experience, it was very, very challenging. And there were some of the tasks that I, I didn't even get to complete, you know, but I learned something there because I thought I'm like, all right, so I wasn't able to complete this uh, technical uh, rope rescue problem and my uh, met rock uh, exercise was not the best. I'm like, I'm, I'm dead in the water. This guy's one perfection and I perform less, less than that standard. So when I'm going through my board at the end of the selection, all of those things came about. The, and it was uh, almost like a courtroom. You realize that you failed to blah, 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 blah. Yes. You realize that you failed to blah, 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 blah. You realize that in this environment, you cannot operate on those standards. You have no room for failure. This is the way that we operate here. It's like, yes, I realize that. And they're like, so why do you think we should take you? And I still remember the answer that I gave uh, Colonel Stefan at the time. You know, he was the commander of the 24th Special Tactics Squadron. And I told him, sir, my, my time in this career field has been limited up to this point, but not one day passes that I do not aspire to be a member of this unit. And I told him the reason why, you know, the Mogadishu mission and then just another way to test myself to the limit. And I told him, I, I realize now this was a moment of discovery for me. And those are not going to be often, you know, where I come unprepared. 
But what I realized here is that you need to train to perfection if you want to come here. And that was the first time that I ended up hearing the quote someplace, amateurs train until they get it right, but professionals train until they cannot get it wrong. And that became a model for life for me. So they made the decision and they decided to take me in. And they told me, you better be in tip top shape by the time you get back. So what do I do? I go back to Holloman and I start working on all of those things that I was weak at. By the time I reported to Green Team, man, it was almost second nature, just being proactive and self-disciplined to be able to go ahead and make sure that you knew the task at hand, that you had the skills that you practice at least seven times. That was my rule. Seven times you will practice and you will mess with your gear until you're comfortable enough to where you can execute and deal with contingencies. But uh, that was one of the best lessons that I learned going through uh, the green team process. And part of what comes with the personality type that attracts special operations is wanting to be the best, wanting to be at the highest level. And we tell our students to take things one step at a time or segment their training. So obviously focus on being a great candidate first and focus on handling your past test scores, focus on getting selected and being a great teammate, and then focus on your first deployment. And we understand all that, but we kind of break that down into your five meter target, your 10 meter target. Well, your, your hundred meter target or however you want to put your 500 meter target, in, in my opinion, should always be tier one operations if you're going into special operations, because that is the highest level. And what comes with the personality is striving to be at the highest level. And CZ was able to assess and get picked up at that level. And it's not an easy task and it's not for everybody. And like we said earlier, it does take a special type of family and a special type of individual to get there. So CZ, if you wouldn't mind telling us, what are some of the differences between tier one operations and tier two operations being your, your top secret clearance guys, the guys that are operating up there at the 24th STS versus maybe your guys down at the 23rd STS or the 306 rescue squadron or the 48th, the unit you used to be at. Yeah. So I think the main difference, I mean, the core skills will remain the same. You, you're always going to be a rescue specialist, but what happens then is your ability to uh, interact and interoperate with Navy and uh, army personnel on a continuous basis. Uh, that entails the members to be open-minded enough to understand the cultures of both of those entities. And number two, to be able to train to a higher standard because of the national mission force that is, uh, is required of those units involved in that particular uh, construct. Now, the differences are, you know, the budget, you know, that, that's a big one because we have a lot of leeway on how to train and uh, test equipment. We can expedite a lot of things. And that is because of the, the changing nature of warfare and the requirements of the command. The other thing is that you're able to create things and then serve as a model for the career field and the Air Force. In this case, uh, for us, the Navy does it with the Navy and the Army does it with the Army. But a lot of good practices and lessons learned, including leadership lessons, are uh, bred in that ground. And uh, so that is probably the main difference, the, the nature of the mission and uh, the resources available to get after it. So CZ, you end up getting picked up by the 2-4. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you in changing that ops tempo? And, and maybe if you're able to discuss any of the missions that we've read a little bit about on Wikipedia or have heard you talk about open source. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, it is challenging because you can be gone at a moment's notice. And I remember being with my father-in-law in the golf course and getting, uh, we, we had pagers at the time, you know, getting the page and uh, being gone for 30 days. Uh, and then it's like, honey, I'll see you. And uh, then your spouse will understand what that is all about. Because when the beeper goes off, you know, it's either a test or real world. And then when it's real world, they know that they're not going to have contact with you. So that happened uh, a couple of times. And then once the global war on terror kicked off, it was almost consistent. You know, we had the cycle, you know, you train for about three months, you pull alert for about another three months, and then you reconstitute for three months. And then you have a, a time where you could take leave and so on. But chances are that in that leave time, you're doing stuff back in garrison, basically at home station, taking care of other training requirements that you need to do as a pararescue and combat controller, attack P and so on. So it, it was just a continuous cycle. So I, I was suspected to be gone uh, 200 to 230 days out of the year easily. Uh, and I was newly married because Janet and I got married as soon as I graduated green team 
we were dating for a couple of years. And uh, man, the first few years of our marriage is a blur. I mean, she didn't have it. And then I would come home with this scraggly beard and she'd be shaved, you know. And uh, then, you know, you just come back and you start growing the beard again and you go. And so that was uh, that was life for all of us. And then the few times that we had together with friends and everything else, I mean, we didn't take that for granted. I mean, we appreciated life for what it was because we knew that we were going to be gone again, uh, again shortly. But uh, that was life at that time. When it comes to the missions, man, you know, the story is the same. If you talk to any one of us from now or then in my particular peer group and then from Scotty or Mulkey things, it's the same story, man. You know, bad things happen. You go there, you perform to the best of your abilities and you come out of that, you know, with uh, a lot of lessons and uh, often a lot of baggage. Um, but, you know, it, it's just the nature of what we do and, uh, you know, we just we just accept it for the same reason that I said, hey, those talents are specific to a need and that need is a purpose for life. And that purpose for lies for life is, uh, you know, to do things that others may live. So it, it's simplified, but uh, complex when it comes to processing everything that goes along with it. Incredible CZ shout out to you and shout out to all of our tier one operators, past, present. Um, it, it takes an entire another level of sacrifice for these operators and for their families in order to make this work. So shout out to the spouses out there and the families that make that sacrifice every single day. Uh, CZ part of being an operator at that level is, is interoperability, right. And being able to operate with the Navy, the Marine Corps and the army. Can you give any advice to our listeners out there about what it's like to be an air force guy, right? Only air force guy showing up on a team of, of all seals or, or all army guys, right. And showing up and saying, Hey, I'm, I'm part of the team now. How do you carry yourself and, and how do you set yourself up for success like that? CZ. So a lot of it has to do with personality, Jason, and also with character. Um, you know, the trait of humility uh, comes into mind because you really have to be open-minded. And for all the listeners out there, join is not about becoming, join is about understanding. And let me explain what that means. When I reported to Dan Neck to do my first rotation, even during green team, I never went in there wanting to be or act like another Navy SEAL. I knew my lot in life. I'm a pararescue man. I'm here to do something that they are not equipped to do. And that's why they brought me here. So I concentrated on being the best PJ possible. And we had a lot of great studs that came out of our green team and uh, the green team before us. And uh, those guys were out there, man, just exemplifying that. So, you know, that was, that was really the saving grace. The one thing that the, that the SEALs, uh, my peers, cared about at the time was that they could depend on the best PJ they could have at the time in a complex mission set. And that's exactly what I gave them, you know. And when you do that, you build a reputation. And your reputation is unique to your talents, not because you try to become a part of the herd. It is just because you are the thing that they were missing that they needed the most and that they can depend on. Hey Amen. Your reputation is unique to your talents. If you're listening, take notes to that. Thanks for that piece of wisdom, CZ. And you finished up your, your career at Tier 1 Operations and just kept moving on up the ladder. Can you tell us a little bit about the path to how you got to where you're at now? <laughs> yeah. So I remember, I remember the day that I was asked if I had any interest of becoming uh, a command chief. Now, at certain points in your career, you think that you may want to do certain things or another. Um, once, once I became a PJ chief and I was back in the tier one community, man, I thought that that was going to be it. I was going to homestead until uh, I couldn't anymore, retire, and uh, that was going to be life. But this was after uh, a critical national mission. And we had uh, a close hold of war ceremony. And the chief master sergeant of the Air Force at the time was invited. Uh, everybody that had troops in that particular formation that carried out this mission, the key leaders were invited. And Chief Roy at the time came forward and uh, he asked me, um, hey, uh, have you ever thought about being a command chief? And I told him, nah, I mean, I'm not interested in that, you know. And he said, well, why not? I was just like, you know, a bunch of chicken dinner eaters and, uh, you know, handing out coins. That's not what we do. This is what we do, what you're experiencing here, this mission. And he's just like, well, you see, that's the problem, CC. I have a lot of people out there that do not understand what is going on here. And I need help because this is just the beginning 
of all of the issues that we're going to face fighting war this long. And I need people with street cred out there to be able to go ahead and lead, especially in the joint environment. And I was just like, ah, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sold. And, you know, so he's just like, all right, I'll give you a week to think about it. And uh, I'll get back with you. I'm like, man, he's the chief master of the Air Force. He's never going to get back to me. But he called. But in the meantime, what I did is I contacted a couple of people that I really hold near and dear to my heart as some of my lead mentors. One of them, and the main one being uh, Chief Master Sergeant Retired Wayne Fisk. And I asked Wayne, uh, Wayne, what do you think about this? And Wayne told me, he's like, hey, a long time ago, I heard from Paul Eric, Chief Master of the Air Force number one, never forget to pay back the institution that made you who you are today. I was just like, uh, okay. So I knew where he was going, man. He cast it, he hooked me, and he was going to tell me, hey, you need to do this. So I was just like, Wayne, in short, what you're telling me is you need to do this. Like, absolutely, you need to do that. You need to lead the Air Force, not just pararescue or special tactics. So I did it. And then once again, I went in blind into something that I had no interest in doing or that I didn't feel that I was all in. But this is what happened. Um, I reported to the first special operations wing as my first command chief duty. And it wasn't even a month into the duty that we got called for another national mission. That was the rescue of Jessica Buchanan in Somalia. She was being held hostage by uh, Somali pirates. So I got called up uh, to the uh, Joint Operations Center on a Saturday afternoon. And the president had made the decision that we're going to go after Jessica because she's sick and we don't know how much longer she can sustain her current physical state. So in a matter of a couple of hours, went back home, grabbed my bags, got on a plane, went to Bragg, Bragg to, uh, uh, to North Africa and then East Africa. And within a matter of less than three days, you know, we had Jessica back and uh, Paul Fiston. You know, another mission similar to the one that just took place here a few days ago. However, you know, that was just an eye-opening experience where I understood what Chief Roy said, that we need your kind of expertise in some of these units to make sure that we do not get it wrong. And uh, so that was my awakening moment. It's like, all right, wow. So I don't have to be a chicken dinner eater. I don't have to be a coin hander and handshaker. I mean, I can actually employ these talents that brought me here to this point for the better of the organization. And that's what I've been doing ever since. And if you ask, how did I get to be the SEAC, man, I never bid for assignment, except for the 24 Special Tactics Squadron. After that, I went where the Air Force needed me and didn't complain about it, just went ahead and uh, went with the mentality of, hey, wherever you go, there you are, so make yourself useful and make a difference. And every organization that I did, uh, that I went, I did just that and created this reputation at all different levels, mainstream Air Force, fighter community, special ops community, garrison, support personnel, joint entities. And when General Milley came up to make the decision for his senior enlisted advisor to the chairman, that's what tipped the scales for him. It was just that diversity of thought and experience all across in what former commanders and peers said about their interactions with me. Again, that credibility and humility ended up uh, pushing forward to where we are today. Hooyah, CZ. That's incredible. Appreciate that story. And for our listeners out there, you've heard us talk about serving your purpose. And sometimes it's not exactly what you would want to do, but you know it's what you're meant to do. And it sounded like CZ hopped into something that he necessarily said, I, I don't know if this is exactly what I want to do, but you know what? I got to do this. I'm going to step it up and I'm going to do this. And here you are representing our community, representing a lot of different communities, CZ. And we really do appreciate you stepping up, especially us as PJs, past, former, and future. Uh, thank you for what you do, brother. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And uh, for everybody listening, just remember that once you go ahead and pass through those gates and you start reciting that creed, that is for life. That is not just to get through training. And uh, I still refer to it this day. Amen to that. And CZ, a, a couple, I know we we're kind of running out of time and we're going to have our students on here with some live Q and a, to be able to ask you some questions. Wanted to ask you the man himself, what you think about some of these new changes that the air force is making. So we have human performance that is now moving its way into all of athletics, all of performance, whether it be healthcare or whether it be war fighting, you see this system of data collecting and intervention and technology where we are trying to boost 
boost the ability for not just athletes, but now war fighters to increase their, their sleep ability, their durability, injury prevention, mobility, um, uh, recovery, or even their ability to actually do their job, uh, physical readiness, you name it. So now what we seem to be shifting towards is the air force seems to be the tip of the spear on this is this special warfare operator enlistment vectoring program. And if you are going through pararescue guard or reserve or combat control or, or attack P guard, this you're exempt from this. The, the way that the air force still has it is you can secure your contract before going off into selection or boot camp. But if you are going through your typical active duty contract, you will get what's called your SWOE contract. And so you enlist into this open general where you take the pass test and everyone goes through essentially the same numbers. You'll go through basic training, learn about these career fields, go through spec war prep course, learn further about these career fields, get prepped physically and mentally, and then head on out to the assessment and selection course. So with all of these changes, you see a little bit more uh, positioning in the Air Force to say, this is what we feel that you guys are a little bit more meant to do based on your behavioral ability, your mental capacity, your resiliency, and your physical ability. So you see students that maybe didn't even know about pararescue or didn't know about combat control. They come in and they say, all right, I just want to be Air Force Special Warfare. I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to let the Air Force kind of vector me in. What are your thoughts on all of these changes, CZ? Well, first of all, I believe that the changes are an advantage for the nation, really, because, I mean, I wouldn't wish on anyone what I went through, just going blind into this program, all right, because most people that go blind tend to quit for whatever reason. What we're doing right now is we're applying the technology that is available to all of us to be able to go ahead and better gauge, you know, the health and readiness of the force. This is something that I'm taking on heavily here this next calendar year. It's called the Total Force Fitness to where we're going to go head to toe checks on a triad to be able to make sure that we properly assess and prevent injuries in order to keep the force, not just special warfare and special operations, but the total force employed. And we have gotten quite a few lessons from this uh, COVID pandemic on things that we can do. But even as we speak right now, Jason, I mean, I'm wearing uh, biometric measuring items, you know, my ring, my watch, and these are things that we're utilizing to, you know, again, get better, uh, get better data on how well we're sleeping, uh, how our brain is functioning, uh, what level of fitness we need to go ahead and perform that particular day, depending on how well you rested and your diet. So now we're putting all of those things into practice right now to make sure that we capitalize on every single well-prepared human that is able to go ahead and enter our program and be able to sustain throughout the years. The other thing that we're doing is we're developing baselines of behavior and uh, capabilities. You know, if somebody's weak, you know, in the lower part of their body, now we're able to identify it. Remember, I said that I was weak at uh, finning at the time because of injuries. Man, that could have been prevented. And I could have been, instead of doing linear training, like running push-ups and swimming, they would have had me doing squats and other things to be able to go ahead and get my legs stronger. Remember, the answer is not the kick to the groin. You know, the end state is to create an entity that is able to carry out this mission that very few humans are talented or gifted enough to do, you know, and we say humans because we open up the career field to females for that same reason. We need to capitalize on every single American able men or women to be able to go ahead and fill our ranks because at the end of the day, when we get into a great power competition war, we're going to need every single available human to be able to get after that. And uh, we'll be fools if we diminish the pool of talent that we have by gender. So that's why the decision was made. And that's why the standards were pretty much uh, shifted to a more scientific method to make sure that anybody, regardless of gender, is able to go ahead and carry out this mission. And trust me, it's not about making sure that it's not about saying that we have women in our ranks because the government told us to do. No, it's because we have a huge talent pool that we haven't tapped into. And that is just critical to, uh, to all of us and to the preservation of, uh, of national security. Amen, CZ. And I know we're running out of time here. What would be the last piece of advice for our listeners out there that maybe you would have told yourself before you went through, out of all you've been through? Well, the one thing that I will say is, you know, if, if, if you have courage enough to walk through that gate, don't have the shame to walk out of it. Make the decision because you're willing to go ahead and pour your heart and soul into this. 
Take the time to train. Take the time to understand what is required of you. And if you have the talents and the abilities to be able to do it, regardless of where you come from, put yourself out there and give it a shot. Like I said, for me, it was a, a life-defining moment. And it can be for you too. But you will never know unless you go ahead and put your metal to the test uh, when it comes to whether you got what it takes to be a special operator in, uh, in our nation's armed forces. Well, there you have it from the man himself, SEAC, Ray Colon Lopez. Thank you so much for coming on with us tonight and telling us your story and letting us interview you. We'll go ahead and take a pause here and then we'll rock and roll with some of our SOCOM athletes, students, our team leaders in particular for live Q&A. Thanks again. Brought to you by SOCOM Athletes. Send